We're on verse number eight, and the title for today's sermon is Faith-Filled Obedience. If you can stand, please stand for the reading of God's Word. I'm reading from the New International Version. God's Word says this, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. Verse 10. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised, they only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they were looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Verse 16. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when tested, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So as I said, today we continue our look at Hebrews chapter 11. Last Sunday, we completed our look at the first three individuals who appear in Hebrews chapter 11. We said last week that William Hendrickson calls these three individuals the pioneers of the faith. Now, how many of you remember who the, the names of these first three individuals in Hebrews 11 is? Who's got it? Abel, Enoch, and Noah. All right, very good. And if you remember, as we looked at each one of them, we learned something about faith. We said that each one of them offered something that was faith-filled to God. Who remembers what Abel offered to God? Faith-filled worship. What about Enoch? He offered a faith-filled walk. And then Noah offered faith-filled work to God when he built his ark. Now today, we're going to transition from the pioneers of the faith, and now we're going to talk a little bit about and focus on what, who are called the patriarchs of the faith. We're, looking, we're talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These three individuals had such an important role in God's plan of salvation that when God appeared to Moses at the burning bush in the book of Exodus, he revealed himself to, to Moses in this way. Look at what he said in Exodus 3, 6. He said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So today we're going to focus on Abraham. I want you to see what the Apostle Paul says about Abraham in Romans chapter 4, verse 16. He says that Abraham is the father of Abraham us all. Now, why does he get that title? We're going to learn a little bit about Abraham's life here. 
Now, as you read this passage that we just finished reading, and you compare what's said about Abraham with what's said about everybody else in Hebrews chapter 11, you're going to notice that Abraham, there's a lot more that's said about him than anybody else. Most people, most of these saints of the Old Testament that appear to us in Hebrews chapter 11, they get one, two verses. But look at how much time Hebrews 11 dedicates to talk to us about Abraham. There's about 12 verses if you're counting. So if we look at those 12 verses, we can, we can see and we study those 12 verses, we, we, we discern that the writer of Hebrews is telling us about the life of Abraham, and the writer of Hebrews divides the life of Abraham into four separate chapters. Let me show you the four chapters that are up on the screen. If you look at how many times it says by faith, you got a chapter in Abraham's life, and it actually shows up four different times. So we're saying, these are the titles that I gave to him. It's going to help us to kind of hold on to it. So chapter 1 in Abraham's life is in verse 8, follow me. Chapter 2 is verses 9 through 10, and that's keep going. Chapter 3 of Abraham's life is verses 11 and 12, and that's baby steps. And then the fourth chapter that we're going to save for next week, that's verses 17 to 19, and we're going to entitle that Hold on. So just remember, remind me next week to not forget about hold on because we got to come back to that. We'll hold on to that one till next week if you know what I'm saying, okay? So let's start with chapter one of Abraham's life as it is presented to us in Hebrews chapter 11. Look at verse 8. Hebrews 11, verse 8, and let's look at the counterpart to that in the Old Testament by looking at Genesis chapter 12, verses 1. Through two, God's word says this, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed, key word, obeyed, that's where we get the faith-filled obedience, and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Let's look at Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make you a great na a name and you will be a blessing. Now I want you to know that before Hebrews chapter 12, I mean Genesis chapter 12 rolls around, Abraham was minding his own business before God showed up in his life. Abraham was doing great. He lived with his father. He lived with his wife. He had his brothers. He lived with his nephew, Lot. And he had everything that he had. He had his own town. He had his own tribe. He had everything that he needed in his life at that point. When God showed up and God interrupted his life in order to redirect Abraham's life with these two words, leave and go. Now, according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, last lines, did Abraham know where he was going when he left his family? It says there that he did not know where he was going. So imagine that conversation between Abraham and his dad. Abraham gets to that point in his life where he's, Dad, we're leaving. We're going to step out, and we are on our own, and we're leaving. Now, I would imagine that his father, Terah, responded to him by saying, Son, that's great. I'm proud of you. You're stepping out on your own. Where are you going? And Abraham says, I have no idea. We're just going. We're just going to go, and we're going to keep going until we get to where we're supposed to go. I mean, you can just see this conversation as it plays out. And so Abraham, I have a question for everybody here. Oh, actually, well, let me say this. God didn't reveal to him where he was going. He had to step out in faith and follow God's lead. But let me show you what God did reveal to him. He said this to him, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. 
I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. If you keep reading Genesis 12, it goes on to reveal that God was going to bless all the peoples of the world through Abraham. So when I think about God's work with Abraham, I think of a cone, okay? A cone. I kind of think of a cone, it's got two sides to it. On one side, it's a little bit smaller, a little bit more narrow, and then on the other end of the cone, it's a little bit bigger, it's a little bit wider. So think of God's work in Abraham's life in that way. On this side, it just begins with one man. And that work with one man eventually grows and blossoms in steps Jesus, and now it includes all people from every tribe, nation, and tongue throughout the world. Now I have a question for everybody here. How many of you are not originally from Miami? You were not born in Miami. Raise your hand. Okay. That's about 50% or so. So those of you who raise your hand, you, you know whether it was your parents or whether it was you, you know what it's like to leave a place that maybe you're comfortable in that you're used to, to leave that area, that comfort zone, and then to come to a place that maybe you don't even really know what's going to happen when you get there or how things are going to work out. If you've done that, you can identify with what was going on in Abraham's life at that point. I remember back in 2002 when God called my wife and I to go into the ministry. We were both living here in Miami. And we sensed God was calling us to go into the ministry. Uh, we were going to go move to Orlando to go to seminary there in Orlando. And so both of us, we quit our jobs. We had our work here. We quit our jobs. Carrie was seven and a half months pregnant. And we just, we just like, we're like, you know what? God's calling us to go. And I remember, what I do remember was sitting down, having the conversation with my parents. And you should have seen my mother's face when we said, we're leaving and we're taking your grandson who's about to be born in a month and a half with us. But look, God moves in mysterious ways. You see, we, we left, we came back, we brought three grandkids back uh, with us. <laughs> now, the title to this chapter, I call it Follow Me, and it's intentional. It's on purpose. Because that's the same thing Jesus Christ said to his disciples. Remember when Jesus showed up on the shores of, the, of Galilee and his disciples were fishing? And Jesus said to Peter, Andrew, James, and John, he said, follow me. And do you remember how those disciples responded to the call of Jesus? It says here, in Matthew 4, 20. Look at Peter and Andrew's response. At once they left their nets and followed him. Look at James and John's response, kind of similar to Abraham's response. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. What about Jesus when he went to the tax collector's booth and there sat Matthew collecting taxes and Jesus said to him, follow me. The Bible says in Matthew 9, 9, and Matthew got up and followed him. One thing I've learned about the calling of Jesus on his disciples is that Jesus will never show up in your life and say this, just stay there and don't change anything. That's not Jesus' call in your life. Jesus will always call you to a place that you're not. So it's not stay and don't change, it's follow me. As a matter of fact, I'll show you how he phrases it in Matthew 16, verse 24. And Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must, let's say it together, deny himself. And let's say it together, take up his cross. And let's say it together, follow me. To be a follower of Jesus Christ is an invitation for you to die. It's an invitation for you to die so that Jesus Christ can live inside of you. The call 
that God placed on Abraham's life is the same call Jesus places on each one of us who consider him Lord and Savior. Chapter 1. Let's look at chapter 2. Chapter 2, you find it in verses 9 and 10. And I titled it, Keep Going. Keep going, Abraham. Look at what it says in verse 9 and 10. By faith, he made his home in the promised land. Like a stranger in a foreign country, he lived in tents, and as did Isaac and Jacob, and we'll talk more about them next week, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. You see, when God came to Abraham, he made a promise that he was going to give him a great land. A great land. Abraham lived to be 175 years. And do you want to know something? He never inherited the land. He never did. His descendants don't inherit the land until 440 years later. You say 440 years? Yeah, because the Israelites were slaves in Egypt for 400 years after Joseph died. And after 400 years of captivity in Egypt, it took Moses 40 years of wandering in the wilderness with the Israelites for Joshua to step in. And then it was Joshua who led the Israelites across the Jordan River to inherit the promised land. So this promise that God made to Abraham, Abraham never saw its fulfillment. It wasn't until 440 years later that his descendants would inherit that land. So in 175 years, let me show you the one thing that Abraham did inherit of the land. This is the only thing he got out of the promised land that God had given to him. Genesis 23, verse 20. So the field and the cave in it were deeded to Abraham by the Hittites as a burial site. Are you getting this? The only thing Abraham got out of the promised land was a cave. And in that cave, he would bury his wife, Sarah, when the time came. Look at what it says in Hebrews 11, verse 13. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on the earth. If you go back to 9 and 10 in Hebrews 11, it says that he lived in tents. The only thing Abraham put down in the promised land were tent pegs. He only laid down a tent. He only saw himself as a stranger, as a foreigner, as an alien in the land that God had promised to him. So then does, didn't that mean, did that mean that because he didn't receive the inheritance that God had promised to him, that he was going to live a life that was frustrated? With God, that he was going to live a life that was totally disappointed with God, that he was going to live a life that was disillusioned with God, angry at God, because God didn't give him what he had thought that God had promised to him? Is that how he lived his life? No. Abraham understood something, that everything that this world has to offer is only temporary. So whether he got the land or he didn't get the land or if he only got a cave or he didn't get a cave, his eyes were set on something that was much more permanent than what anything that this world could offer. He was saying he was looking for, verse 10, he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. He was looking for the city that God was preparing for him. Now, it doesn't matter if you live in an, in an efficiency in Little Havana or if you've got a mansion in the Redlands or if you've got a condo by the beach. Don't set your heart on those things. Those things are here today. They're gone tomorrow. Set your heart on things that people can't take away from you. Set your heart on the city that God is building for you through his son, Jesus Christ. Look at what it says in John chapter 14, verse 2 and 3. Jesus speaking to his followers. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, 
I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. This, is in, this chapter of Abraham's life is entitled, Keep Going. Like, don't, don't be satisfied with what you find here. Keep going. Set your heart on things that are to come. Set your heart on things where Christ is, where the Christ that who died for you is going to come back and rescue us one day. Keep going. Keep going. Chapter 3. All right, so we looked at follow me. We looked at keep going. Chapter 3 in his life, I called it baby steps. So let's look at verse 11 and 12. Hebrews 11, 11 and 12. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and as he, and he as good as dead, came the descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand of the seashore. See, God promised Abraham two things. He promised him a great land, and he promised him a great people. Now, one thing that I love about the Bible is that the Bible is brutally honest about the shortcomings of the people of God. Brutally, completely honest about the ways that God's people fall short of God's glory. The first time that Sarah heard the news that she was going to give birth to a child the following year, do you remember how Sarah responded? She, she what? She laughed at the news that she would give birth to a child. As a matter of fact, that's why they called the child Isaac, which means laughter, because she laughed at God when she heard the news that she was going to give birth to a child. I mean, goodness, first of all, she was past childbearing, the childbearing age. She herself wasn't even able to conceive before she had reached that age. I mean, she just couldn't believe and couldn't even imagine that that could even possibly come true. So she laughed at the news. And when God said, why did you laugh? She said, I didn't laugh. She denied. She tried to lie to God. Not only did she laugh at God, she lied to God. And God said, no, you did laugh. So she's got the promise and she's thinking, listen, I, there's no way I want to be able to, at my age, to be able to have children. So I got a better idea, Abraham. Let's do this. She came up with a plan for Abraham to have a child through the maidservant, Hagar, in their home. And if you want to read how that turned out to be a complete disaster, you can read about it tonight in Genesis chapter 16. They were often motivated, this couple, Abraham and Sarah, were often motivated by fear, by despair, by impatience. So why in the world would they show up here in Hebrews chapter 11? They're in, in Hebrews chapter 11 not because of their faithfulness to God, but because of God's faithfulness to them. Not, about, not because of their perfect commitment to God, but because of God's commitment to them. It's not because their ability to hold on to God. They're here because God never let go of them. It says this in Genesis 15, 6 about Abraham. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited to him as righteousness. What is this saying? This is saying that God reached down by grace 
And Abraham responded by reaching up in faith to God. If you want to do something cool this week, I want you to see how Abraham responds every time God does something for him. In Genesis, starting in Genesis 12. I think it goes Genesis 12 to Genesis 25. The story of Abraham. Every time God does something for Abraham, he always responds by either building an altar or calling on the name of God and worshiping him. This is not about Abraham. This is about God and God's work in Abraham's life. A God who waited till he was 100 years old and Sarah was 90 years old to give them the child that he had promised to give them. And God did that to show us that with God, nothing is impossible. God also gave us another child. Look at the way Galatians, the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5, describe this child that God gave to us. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sonship. Isaac was born at the appointed time. Jesus was born at God's appointed time. Abraham left his home to follow God's will for his life. Jesus left his throne to come to this world to fulfill God's promise of salvation. Abraham only saw himself as a wanderer in this world, never really at home. Jesus, fully God, fully man, and never saw himself fully at home in this place. The word of God says that Jesus said, foxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Abraham wandered because he was looking for the city whose architect and builder was God. Jesus came to show us that he's the architect and that he's the builder and that he's the chief cornerstone with what God is trying to build with our lives. Jesus said this, before Abraham was, I am. And it is because Jesus Christ, who died, it, said, it says here that, um, not in this passage, but it says that Abraham was as good as dead. Jesus actually died. But he came back to life. And he did what he did for God's people so that we can respond to him, to the one who did deny himself, to the one who did take up the cross, to the one who did die and rose again for our forgiveness of our sins, who did that for us so that we can respond to him by denying ourselves, by taking up our crosses, and by following him wherever he leads us. Let's bow in prayer.